Joining us now is Steve Sell. Uh, he is the Sky Crane Specialist on JPL's Entry, Descent, and Landing Team. Thanks for uh, talking with us today, Steve. Oh, no problem. So I want to start by just asking uh, what drew you to this mission? Oh, well, it's, it's a very exciting mission. Uh, I like it because we're doing several things that have never been done before. It's the largest rover we've ever uh, flown, and it's uh, we're doing some new and exciting technologies like the sky crane, for example, and guided entry, and it's uh, allowing us to accomplish much more than past missions have. Now, we've got a lot of tech fans uh, in our audience, and they all want to know what kind of technology is in there, what kind of processors, networking, et cetera. What can you tell us uh, is in both the, the delivery vehicle and, and the lander? Oh, well, it's all, it's actually kind of all very boring stuff. It's very uh, tried. Not to our audience, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we use a RAD 750 as the main processor. We actually have two of those, so a primary and a backup. And we use a, a, a bus called uh, 1553 for communicating to all the various uh, sensors and actuators that are located throughout the uh, spacecraft. And that's a very common bus. Uh, it's used a lot in uh, applications for space and military. It's highly reliable. It's It's got built-in redundancy, and it allows us to uh, uh, basically uh, keep a lot of uh, robustness in the communications throughout the vehicle. Is it all hardened communications? Is, are there cables, are there Ethernet cables? Is there anything a, a consumer would recognize in there? Uh, no, there's nothing. Uh, it's not Ethernet. It's 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 similar to Ethernet. It's just a 1553 protocol, uh, and those are all through just coax. Those are coax cables. It's highly shielded. Um, it, the communications actually is a little bit slower than typical Ethernet. It's about a megabit per second or so on those lines, and that uh, and that's all done to keep things uh, uh, very simple and robust. How does one become a sky crane specialist exactly? Uh, well, a lot of it is just uh, being at the right place at the right time. But uh, whenever uh, JPL starts to put together uh, these missions, they just uh, they, they pull from uh, we have an entry, descent and landing group here at JPL. And uh, as the mission starts to come together in the design phase, we're pulling in people from those groups and uh, and I was the one that uh, came in to be the systems engineer for the uh, sky crane portion of the mission. So tell us about what's going to happen uh, during the landing, especially the part that you're concerned with. Uh, there were several people in our audience who were wondering why it is so complex and why you need a sky crane to lower the lander to the surface. Well, we get that a lot. Actually. Yeah, I bet you it, do. It does look crazy uh, when you when you just first see it, but uh, as you go through the design and all the reasoning that went into uh, every decision we made, it actually turns out that it's 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 all the result of very rational and logical thought. Uh, and the, the reasons we went to a system like Skycrane to, to land the rover is past missions have used things like legged landers uh, or airbags. And the, the legged lander systems... Uh, the problems with those are when you're trying to land a one-ton uh, rover, you you have to have big rocket engines to to complete the final portion of the descent. And you have big rocket engines, you want to keep those big rocket engines away from the surface. You don't want to be firing those things uh, just a few feet above the surface. And so th that kind of makes the legs want to be a lot taller. And so when you have the legs taller and now the rover on top of those legs, you then tend to be top-heavy, and that makes it... Uh, more difficult to be stable while you're touching down. Um, in addition, now even if you did land on the surface with tall legs and the rover on top, you have to deploy some kind of complicated ramp system or or other way of getting the rover off the top of that that platform. With airbags, uh, like we used on the uh, MER rovers and the Pathfinder rovers. Um, uh, the airbag system, when you scale it up to land something that's one ton, you then have to uh, you, you then have to get 
out of the inside of those airbags. Now on MER and Pathfinder, there was a retraction mechanism that the airbags would deflate once we were on the surface and it would, re it would retract the deflated airbags kind of under the pod and then we would drive off the top of that. In order to make the system work for a one-ton rover, those airbags would have to be much, much, much larger and it would, it's almost impossible to figure a way to w retract those airbags reliably and make a safe path to drive the rover off the top. And so we decided that uh, that another approach was needed. And when you look at, if you extend the airbag system, actually, you can, you start to also have to slow down your descent so that the airbags wouldn't pop if you're trying to land a one-ton rover. And we were looking at that and said, geez, you know, uh, we got to be going slow enough so these airbags wouldn't pop even if we made them really big. So, you know, we're almost going slow enough that a rover could just land on its wheels. And so the idea of being able to just land on our wheels ready to go uh, was born. And that's how we invented the sky, the sky crane system. It sounds incredibly elegant, this idea of, uh, you know, dropping down out of the sky and then touching it softly uh, down on the surface. There's, a, there's an appeal there as well. Tell us a little bit about how the sky crane portion of the landing is going to work. Uh, so the way it works is as we're descending toward the surface, about a, about... Uh, for the last uh, several hundred meters, so the last two to three hundred meters, we're, we're going straight down towards the surface. And when we get 20 meters above the surface or a little over 60 feet, we still maintain our slow descent towards the surface. But the rover separates from the from the descent stage. So we call the, the descent stage or the where the rockets are, uh, we call that the descent stage. And the rover will will separate from that descent stage and lower itself down slowly below uh, the descent stage to about, it, it'll be hanging about seven meters below the descent stage. And the thing, and that whole system just keeps descending toward the surface until the rover is on the ground. And uh, where does the sky crane go after it sets the rover down? Uh, this is a question from Jason, one of our listeners. He wants to know uh, if you can give me an altitude adjustment. He just <laughs> wanted to make the pun, but what, what happens to the crane? <laughs> well, what happens is uh, after we know that the rover is on the surface, so we take about a second and a half to completely be sure that the rover's weight is completely supported by the surface, and then we cut the three bridles that, that, are, that are holding the rover, and the descent stage portion just throttles up and flies itself away to about 400 meters away from the, the rover, and it, and it does do a crash landing. So in a sense, it, its last act is to throw itself away. You're just trying to get it far enough away that it doesn't cause any more dust kicking up. Is that the idea? Yeah, that's right. We want to make it. We want to make sure that it's safely far enough away from the rover that no damage could occur. There's pressurized tanks there. They still have some fuel remaining in them, and we just want to make sure that it that it impacts the ground far enough away that it wouldn't be a problem. Yeah, you don't want to land on the rover either, obviously. Exactly. Um, how will we know that all of this worked? Uh, well, while while we're landing, we have two ways of communicating to Earth. The first is through a system of tones, and we've used those in previous uh, missions, which are simply just radio signals that are sent from this spacecraft. They're very simple. It's You can almost think of them as keys on a piano, and you assign a different meaning for each key. So all the radio receivers on Earth here have to do is just hear that signal, and we know that the spacecraft has made it to various points along the entry, descent, and landing sequence. The other way is once we get uh, once we get closer to touchdown, about five minutes before touchdown or so, we will be able to use the Mars Odyssey spacecraft, which is already in orbit around Mars, as a relay to relay back high rate data. Now, what we call high rate data is eight kilobits per second. So I'm sure that's appalling to a lot of <laughs> a lot of the yeah. viewers there. But uh, yeah, eight kilobits per second is all we get back. Uh, but but to to us on the ground, that is a wealth of information. And so we should be able to to track the progress of the entire landing and all the way through about five minutes after landing. The tones makes me think of close encounters. Are they are they programmed? To <laughs> we we thought about trying to program them to play a, a, a song in the in the uh, if it went through the nominal sequence. But, uh, you know, uh, reality set in and we Practic had to just get the work done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I can imagine. So the tones will just tell you what, success or not? Uh, the tones are more like just markers that it got to certain stages along mm -hmm. the way. 
So parachute deployed, a tone will sound when that happens. Uh, when the back shell separation happens, so when the when the when the jetpack first fires up, like you'll get a tone there. So they're more just like markers that it's got it's it's reached certain milestones. We don't actually get. Uh, any information there. We also have a few tones that are that are designed to to uh, to just indicate that the system is healthy, um, but it but we can't, for example, transmit numbers or data or pictures back with the tones. Now, when will you get the first tone versus the the more rich data that you're getting from Odyssey? Uh, we will get the first tone uh, about 11 minutes before entry into the atmosphere. And then we pick up the uh, Odyssey high rate data about two minutes after we've entered the atmosphere. So, so for the first uh, 13 to 14 minutes or so, the only information we'll have are these tones. So will, will success of the landing come from the tone or will you have to wait for confirmation from Odyssey? Uh, so we actually, due to orbital geometry, the Earth will actually set from view of the spacecraft uh, before we land. So the only information we'll have at landing is the Odyssey relay. So uh, that's our that's our confirmation that everything went well. Now, is there anything you'll be doing during the descent other than like the rest of us just watching and waiting? Do you have any actions that you you can or need to take? Uh, there is nothing that we can actually do during the descent and landing from from Earth. Uh, the speed of light delay in transmitting the signal it takes about 14 minutes for signals to reach uh, to travel between Earth and Mars. So uh, it, the whole landing sequence um, from the time we hit the atmosphere till we're on the ground is only seven minutes long. So there's really no interaction we can have with the with the spacecraft as it's going through entry, descent, and landing. And in fact, the last time we actually send a command to the spacecraft is two hours before all of this occurs. So during the event itself, it's just rooms full of engineers here at JPL hanging on every bite of information that comes in through through the uh, uh, through the relay. And we're we're paying attention to that. The reason it's important that we pay attention to that is should something go wrong and we actually not have uh, uh, as as good of a landing as we had hoped, we want to make sure we understand what the state of the spacecraft is, what the state of the rover is when it's on the surface. We want to make sure that we, we have the, as much information as fast as possible. Now, and there are commands you can send that will take 14 minutes to get there, obviously, but afterwards to try to reboot things or adjust? Uh, that's right, but those would actually happen about two hours uh, uh, later when uh, Odyssey has to go, Odyssey mm -hmm. will set the view of the spacecraft, it goes around Mars, we get another uh, communications pass with, with Odyssey um, uh, two hours later. However, uh, there is no intended commanding uh, during that pass as well. That's more of a uh, information uh, information relay back from the rover, sending sending some pictures and things like that. I don't know if you kn you know this, but uh, some people in our chat room immediately started wondering what programming language uh, it, the the software is written in. <laughs> it's written in C. Okay. Yep. Easy enough. Not C plus plus, just C. Uh, there is some C plus plus as well, but uh, but in general, it's you know it's C. Uh, we use. Um, we use VxWorks as our uh, as our uh, operating environment on the spacecraft, and so it's 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 written in that. Great. So, what will you do after the landing? Do you have a continued role in the mission as it does its exploration? Uh, well, the entry, descent, and landing team will will remain engaged for uh, very intently for the first few days after landing, as we start to get more and more information back. As you can imagine, uh, the the spacecraft is actually recording. Uh, megabytes and megabytes of data on the way down, and we can only send back uh, uh, a very small portion of that. It's it's actually during the event itself, it's less than a megabyte. It's about 760 k or so of data will come back during landing. But we want we want this this the several hundred megabytes of of high rate data that actually got recorded, so that we can understand how well our analysis and uh, pre landing predictions were, and so. Um, that stuff will start getting transmitted back in the days and weeks following landing. And so the EDL team will really stay engaged for a while. Uh, and um, and so we go through this process of reconstructing what actually happened. And, and then uh, that helps future missions understand uh, 
basically how well we were able to predict what would happen and how well our computer models work and things like that. And that gets squeezed back at 8 kilobits per second? Uh, that'll actually come back at a higher rate. Once the once the rover's on the ground, uh, they can up the uh, transmission rate through Odyssey. Uh, once when, when the rover's not moving around a lot, the, the signal's a lot more stable. And so um, they they do something, it's an adaptive data rate that they can do uh, as, as Odyssey passes overhead. It's about a 10-minute window each time, and they can go up to about a megabit. Uh, at it at the peak transmission rate during those so we can get a few megabytes of information back uh, uh, per Odyssey pass uh, and we can also use the Mars reconnaissance orbiter another another spacecraft around Mars so we get uh, roughly four passes four opportunities to get data back per day at those much higher data rates curiosity has the, the same problem we do when when we're stable we get a better data connection than when we're moving around <laughs> And that's why that's why we keep the data rate so low during landing because the spacecraft's going through a lot of violent maneuvering and and, and quick turns and things like that. And we want to make sure that the Odyssey spacecraft can remain locked on the uh, the carrier signal. Now, what's the first order of business for Curiosity after landing? What does what does it do first, assuming everything has gone well? Well, assuming everything goes well, the first thing that happens is we take two pictures uh, with the, what we call the Hascams, which are. Uh, cameras that are mounted on the very front of the rover and the rear of the rover. And those will hopefully, if we can maintain the link with Odyssey long enough, those will come down about three to four minutes after we land. Um, then over the next few days and weeks, uh, the surface team will take over operation of the vehicle and they will start deploying the cameras. There's a mast cam uh, that we deploy that's a, that will be about six to seven feet off the ground that has stereo cameras on it. Uh, we'll start to take the first panoramic image uh, where, we, you know, we do a 360-degree uh, photo of, of where we landed in the landing site. Um, they start to activate various systems like uh, uh, the arm and releasing all the restraints that are holding the arm down and, and basically starting to check out all the systems, find out how, how they survived the landing event and getting the, the vehicle ready to start its surface science mission. What resolution are the images that you'll be able to send back? And, the, and will you be sending back any video as well? Uh, well, the, to answer the resolution, I'm not 100% sure of the resolution. They're, it's a very high resolution camera. These, these images are, are very similar to the panoramic uh, camera images that you've seen from MER and uh, so Spirit and Opportunity okay. that are there now. Um, we will be sending back a very interesting video uh, uh, over the first few weeks, and and I, I didn't mention this before, but there is a camera mounted on the bottom of the rover looking down. So we will actually get about a three to four frame per second movie of, of the final uh, part of the landing. So basically after the heat shield comes off the capsule from there all the way down, we'll actually have a movie of that. Um, it's a low frame rate, but it's it's something I'm really looking forward to getting. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. I, I can't wait to see that myself. Uh, how long does NASA anticipate that the mission will last? I know there's a different power source here that, that can give it a little extra life. That's right. Uh, we have a, a radioisotope thermoelectric generator on, on the rover, which is uh, a fancy name for a nuclear battery, uh, generates electricity through uh, radioactive decay uh, heat. Um, and, and that power source uh, will will last uh, for probably much longer than the rover will but the uh, uh, the the planned surface mission is one Martian year which is about two earth years and you know hopefully we'll get a lot more use of it out of that or beyond that is there a, is there a lot of data stored on the machine or is it is it more of a buffer and it's and it's sent back continuously? Uh well, we do have several gigabytes of flash uh, flash storage on the uh, on the rover, and uh, and a lot of what happens is it can store a lot of data and then transmit back parts of that that allow us on the ground to then decide which chunks of that are the most important. So you can imagine that uh, it could be recording a whole lot of, of different information, 90% of which is is uninteresting scientifically, but 10% of it might be extremely interesting scientifically. And so by sending back snapshots or thumbnails of images or things like that, we can then decide which of those images or science data that we want to send back the full resolution of.
best of luck. Uh, I, 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 I'm cheering for you guys. I, I'm really excited about this. Yeah, we are too. I mean, uh, this has been, you know, some of us, I've been on the project for six years. A lot of people here have been on for much longer than that, up to 10 years. Uh, and so, and then there's a whole, you know, the entry, descent and landing is just the start, right? Now there's a, there's a team of hundreds of scientists that are just waiting, chomping at the bit to get started. Awesome. All right. Well, we'll let you go. Thanks again, man. All right. Thank you. All right.